in typical Corentus style, we start off with a coherent moment. And with that, I bring you Alexander to start us off. Thank you, Janice. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, let's do a proper coherence check-in today since it's the first one of the year. So everybody sit back and relax in your seats. And close your eyes and just find your breath and begin breathing in a nice, long, slow, rhythmic pattern. Longer breaths, deeper breaths, slower breaths in. and out. And just feel the shift that comes about by just the pure act of breath. Now shift your attention to the area around your heart, imagining there's a space there where the air can flow in and out. and metaphorically breathe through that space in a slow, long, and deep manner. Now activate a genuine feeling of gratitude or appreciation for someone, something, or someplace in your life. Actually feel that feeling and breathe it in and out through your heart space. Okay, take a deep breath and come back into the room and thank you, Janice. We are happy that you are here. You are a community of global practitioners and it is our joy and our honor to have programs that develop, develop support and care for all of us. Us as practitioners, you as practitioners and to serve the world because gosh knows that we all know that helping people work better together in teams, help the world um, be more sustainable and more coherent and less violent. And with that, I'm going to open our discussion for the day. Thank you, Janice. Today, Janice and Alexander are thought leaders. I am our, our discussion leader. Um, and we're, going, we're here to talk about the role of teams as anchors, drivers, and leaders of culture in organizations. And we're gonna start with a bit of a deep dive into what is culture, how do we think about culture here at Corentis, and then open up the conversation to everybody here to see what examples you have of teams as key formers and key receivers of culture. Um, this is a topic that comes up in our practice. We have organizations asking for us to engage with them on the topic of culture, perhaps you do too. And it's of course something that we think about all the time in terms of the culture that we are as Corentis, our internal team, and also the larger footprint that we have on the world. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Janice. Thank you. Actually, Alexander is going to start. Thank you. And sharing <clears throat> a quote from Edgar Schein. So we thought we'd start off with a few quotes on <clears throat> definitions of culture. And again, we're gonna go through these slides at a rather quick clip so that we can get to the conversation, which in our mind is, is, is the, the more meaty part of, the, of today's, um, today's event. So Shine, um, one of my, you know, one of the people that I followed for many years and an individual who I admired greatly while he was still uh, with us, um, said that the culture is basically the pattern of basic assumptions 
So really lives at the thinking level that a given group has invented, discovered, or developed, therefore created, in learning to cope with its problems of external adaptation. So as it learns to grow and develop vis-a-vis -vis the external world and internal integration as it learns to adapt within itself, and that have worked well enough to be considered valid, therefore true, and therefore to be taught to new members, those entering the culture as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to these problems. So in essence, it's a creative endeavor that happens over time as an entity faces the world and integrates what it's facing within itself and then teaches others as the way it does things, the way it behaves, mm -hmm the way it thinks, perceives, and feels vis-a-vis -vis the world that it has been you know, faced with throughout all that time. Thank you, Janice. Sure. So that was culture and now organizational culture. So a favorite, a new favorite author of mine is Daniel Coyle. And he talks about organizational culture being about the strong sense of identity and belonging with small groups or teams. So obviously this is very close to the heart of what we do at Corentis. It's about the shared values, norms, and behaviors that bind team members together and drive their performance. What's nice about what he talks about um, is talks about building, the culture is actually built through these series of small, repeated interactions, these reinforcers that happen over and over again that foster trust, collaboration, sense of purpose among team members. And it's not just about the messages that leaders send, but about the signals that are sent every single time people communicate and interact. Now, that doesn't mean like, oh, if we blow up in a meeting and that's kind of a one-off, um, that that's something that would completely skew the culture. But it's amazing how many clients do we know, and even probably including ourselves, where you know, you get a survey back and 1% of the people say, oh, you know, that, that speech you gave probably wasn't the best for me or did, like didn't really work for me. And you hold on to that as opposed to the 99% of the other people who said, oh my gosh, it was fabulous. I learned so much. So we also do that as humans as well. So we do have to pay attention to, especially when you're leaders of an organization, people who have influence every single time we interact and communicate with others. And if we find ourselves to have skewed from what the alignment of that culture is to what do we do? Notice, shift, or share. So that is a, a nod to Alexander's um, thinking path uh, video that we widely share that's on our YouTube channel. Another person who I love, um, read quite a bit um, from is Amy Edmondson. And what she talks about from time to time, not just in her books, but in her podcasts and articles, is why teams? Why are teams the social bond? Well, because we're social beings, right? So due to some you know, evolutionary you know, mechanisms, human beings are incredibly attentive, and she uses the words interpersonal phenomena. So what does that really mean? You know, the dawn of human civilization, belonging to a group, what we call a team, they were called clans or bands, you know, meant survival and being rejected meant death. That means that the social bonds between teams is instinctual. It is so core to who we are as humans that it is the powerful social bond that we believe is at the core of any culture, culture of a geographic place, culture of, a, um, of an organization, and that's why it's key to um, what we do in from a culture standpoint, culture change standpoint. So just to put it into graphical format, we as individuals come into an organization and into teams with the thinking and feelings that come from external cultural influences, where people were born and raised, the way in which the cultures in which they come from, et cetera. People come into organizations with that and have that continually throughout their lives. When they come to an organization, they add on another culture and they do that through teaming, right? So teams are those social 
powerful social bonds inherent in teams that influence the shift to more consistent thinking and feeling. And then from an organization-wide standpoint, when teams are part of a system, an organization, the expectation exerted on those teams for the actions and the results needed is absolutely significant. So culture and the bonds are on the teams, but the, but the influence of the organization actually is very significant for that culture on the teaming side, which then brings you into teamings being the heart of an organizational change process and organizational culture. So this is what we believe, focusing on teams in a culture change process significantly accelerates the transformation and leads to success with a more profound impact. And we're gonna bring you to, through very quickly through two different um, tools that we use through for organizational culture change. One is the thinking path, which some of you may know, which sometimes we affectionately call RAFT, and combine that with a what we call the Corentis Air Culture Change Cycle brings teams into the heart of organizational change process. Um, Alexander, would you like to bring us through thinking path? Yeah, sure. I'm wondering just at this point if there are any questions, Janice. Sure. Can I jump in? Yep. So far. I see that Grace has a question. Grace, would you like to bring your question forward? Oh, I just, as I read, um, the Janice introducing about the team concept for the survival earlier days. The, the boundary of a team is always still I'm discovering what, how big or small and what scope are we, I can see a team. And I was just wondering what's her definition of a team hmm. could be extended. It's great in terms of sheer numbers, like what is the most optimal number of members for a team? Is that what you're asking? No, according to um, the the Amy, the author, Amy the, mm -hmm. in her book, what she, what in her mind, a team, her view of a team, how big that is extended. It, it seems like appears to me much larger in a scope, to mm -hmm. her way of looking at the team. I don't think Amy Edmondson in her book, Teaming, has numbers that are bigger than, say, five to seven. Has anyone else seen anything different? Now, multiple teams add up to a larger society or one may call organization. That's multiple teams together, as opposed to the looking at an organization as one team. It's one body, right? It's one system made up of multiple teams. Then can we look at the, like each team as a sort of individual and making those mm. team interaction as well as each teams can make bigger teams? Does anyone want to take on the answer to that before I jump in? Janice, it's Mel, how are you? Hey Mel, good, how are you? <clears throat> good seeing I'm you. I'm great, you too. Um, in some of the work that we're doing uh, over here in culture, really looking at um, uh, organizations as a human system. Mm -hmm. uh, and to your Great. point, it's a system and it's one body. I mean, and then to Grace, to your question, it's looking, you know, if you were to do a parallel to the human, to the human system, mm -hmm. you know, a team could be an organ, you know, the heart of the team, the kidney, the what have you. And there's a complete function unto itself, intact team but yet it impacts the whole system and how that organs and skeletal system and nervous system all dance together makes the one. And we look at culture as the personality, if you will, of that human system of an organization. And then of course, each team has its own culture within the larger culture. So that, I mean, that's how we look at it. If that helps or confuses, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> And Mel, I've seen that metaphor multiple times. What is the part? What are the parts? And what is the whole? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. That's great. Grace, does that help? Yes, thank you. Thank you. It helps. Sure. Thomas, you want to ask your question? 
Yeah. So first of all, hi, Alexander Chenis, um, uh, and everyone, Happy New Year. Um, New Year all of you. Um, uh, I have a question about organizational culture and uh, about formalizing it in an organization as as a system of multiple teams, right? Be I'm asking that because when in, in the past years, when applying for a job, I always ask the question, what, 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 what is the culture in the organization? And nobody could really answer the question. And, and I wonder um, if, do you believe organizations should do an intentional attempt to formalize to a certain extent, probably it's not possible because all is in flux, I, I understand. But um, if, if, I, if I read, um, you know, that we should think about um, uh, values, shared values, norms and behaviors, should organization do an attempt to formalize the cultures somehow? Or should it just be free floating um, and kind of stay in the informal space? Well, what is your opinion on that? Well, you're speaking to the choir in terms of yes. <laughs> we believe the more formal, the better. In fact, the cultures that have a more formal, more explicit, more what we call visible way of interacting are more stable cultures. Because other people know how to interact with them. They're not afraid of making a faux pas, for instance. They're not afraid of being ostracized because it's more explicit. And so we believe the more explicit, the better. Anybody else have a differing opinion? Happy to, for differing opinion. So if, if that is the case, I wonder from the participants in that call, how many organizations do have a formalized organizational culture document mm -hmm. that is shared with new um, staff coming into the organization? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things you're going to see is that besides it being a document and just sitting on a shelf, what we're going to be going through in a couple of minutes is showing really how to bring those into the ways of working of an organization, to reinforce those. And because it's a cycle, like you mentioned, uh, it's it's refined over time, right? Tatska? Yeah, I I don't disagree, Janice. What you in fact, I do think I agree about the the nature to make it overt. But what I would warn against is thinking that you can articulate it, the cultural aspiration from a top down perspective and communicate it. Uh, you know the top down, et cetera, because that's not my experience with how culture works. It's much more horizontal. It's much more uh, through peer relationships. And that's how it goes, um, becomes a vibrant and it goes viral, if you will. In that sense, I think the work by uh, Leandro Herrero is quite, mm. quite on point. So a lot of organizations, I see that in the NGO sector, to think that they can articulate this explicitly and then communicate, communicate, communicate the hell out of it, and that will do it. But that's not, I believe, how it works, at least not in nonprofit sectors. Yeah, which is why we believe teams are at the heart of organizational culture and actually working with teams to generate the articulation of the culture is as important as working with teams to integrate it and reinforce and refine. Yeah. And with that, Alexander, you wanna go through thinking path? Yeah, I mean, I, it's an interesting conversation we've just yeah. had. I tend to lean towards where, a little bit of a differing point of view than Janice, and I tend to lean towards where you are, Tosca. In, in the sense that it's, it's hard to really describe a culture so Thomas, to, to answer your question as well, but in many ways we can provide some general attributes of what a culture looks like and feels like. And we can share those attributes as ways of behaving and ways of acting and ways of being without being too dogmatic about this is the culture and therefore if you're in or you're out. Cultures evolve and change over time and they, and they, and, and they morph. And there needs to be room for that to happen, at least with the clients we've worked with, there's an evolution to culture. Mm -hmm. And sticking with one model tends to prevent that evolution and therefore prevents the actual growth and scaling of the organization. 
Does that make sense? Makes sense. I still believe that, that, as you say, there must be a way to describe somehow um, what kind of the core values, um, norms, and expected behaviors should be. Um, I, I totally get it. It should be lift. It's a lift system, but but still, um, there must be a way to describe it. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, that that's very very rude but um i i i still think there must be a way through adjectives or whatever um to describe it yeah and i think that's what we're going to be going through is is the and right it's a living thing it needs to be integrated into our ways of working and reinforced and refined and it can be articulated and one of the ways in which we articulate that is through the thinking path so one of the models we've used over the years to help organizations articulate their culture is the thinking path. And it's a simple model based on cognitive behavioral therapy, wrote a chapter about it in a book at Georgetown University. And the basic idea, the basic concept is that an organization produces results, which are based upon the actions, which are the behaviors, the ways of working, the procedures, and the ways of really moving through the organization, which are based upon the feelings of that organization, which are based upon its fundamental assumptions and beliefs. And when we look at this model, it's, you know, we, we can debate the notion of thinking coming before feelings or feelings coming before feelings, but or feelings coming before thinking, excuse me. But we're looking fundamentally at a system of beliefs and of assumptions that lives in the organization, which drives a feeling state, which drives behavior, and those behaviors will ultimately drive results. What we also look at is this notion of reinforcers. Within the organization, there are a series of reinforcers that drive the thinking, and those reinforcers are very important to understand. The reinforcers are what drive the fundamental thinking in the organization, those assumptions and beliefs, which then will drive the rest of the thinking path. And we've used this to help map current states and desired states. What is the current state of the culture and what are the desired state of the culture? And it's helped our clients at least start to segment out the different pieces of the thinking path and get to the core of what is actually those fundamental assumptions and beliefs which are at the basis of the thinking path. In terms of reinforcers, what we look at are a number of things. We look at strategy and values. The vision, the mission, the purpose, the objectives and the goals. We look at the organization structure, the way that the organization's hierarchy is laid out, its titles and authority systems, its physical space configurations. We look at processes and technology, the way that the work is done. We look at all of the HR systems which drive behavior. And we look at leadership and management as being fundamentally at the core of what leads and reinforces thinking. So as an organization starts to want to build its desired system, it looks at these basic reinforcers and designs the reinforcers that will drive new thinking compared to the reinforcers that are driving the current thinking. And Alexander, I'd just add that these reinforcers apply at the organization level, which is how we kind of automatically think of these, but they also apply at the team level. We can think about how team members look at and intuit or imagine what's happening around the table, whether it's a real table or a virtual table. That is correct. So here's how we bring the thinking path into the process for culture change. So the first thing that we want to do with an organization and our team is, and we actually have an example that we can talk through which is how do you articulate? How do you go into the rest of the organization and bring from within the articulation of the current thinking and the future state thinking or the desired thing, way of thinking, right? So what is actually happening? What, how do you actually articulate? What is the thinking that is keeping people in the current state? And what is the thinking that is necessary to achieve the desired state, right? What is the articulation of the feeling that is keeping us 
in the current state? What do we really want that feeling to be in the desired state? An articulation of the actions and articulation of the results. Then integration. How do teams, again, think of this through the lens of teams, right? How does a team integrate the new thinking? How does a team then express the new feeling? How does then the team integrate the actions to be reinforced for the results that they're looking for? Right? Again, reinforcement. The way we, we think about the difference between inter, integrate and reinforce is integrate is that opportunity to make a difference in your ways of working. An example would be, we want to go from an individual oriented organization to a team-based organization. So we really need to integrate the, and shift the compensation systems and then reinforce those over time. So the difference between two and three is one is an opportunity to change a system. Three reinforcement is that drumbeat over and over and over again, the reinforcement of the adherence of those systems. And then the last one is refine. So how do you stay present to the desired, the current state and the shift to the desired state, as well as aware of other potential ways of working, other potential um, ways of making the environment better to refine it over time, which makes it a cycle. Because then you want to articulate the new desired state, the new thinking, the new feeling, the new actions, and the new results that come from that. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, The how the two work together? Any thoughts, feelings, reactions? We did some brainstorming of the kinds of questions that people might want to discuss. It's not meant to be prescriptive. Um, these were questions that came up for us as we were thinking about culture and teams and ground up and top down. So I'll simply use these as prompts for further discussion. And we would be interested really, if I just start at the top, if there are one or two brief case studies that people want to share, somebody would like to share about the teams being the engine of culture change. What's a good example of that that you've seen? Alexander and I worked together for a you know better part of a decade with uh, the Oxfam culture that's changing. And I would say it's interesting, based on what Thomas was saying earlier, we came in with a culture that had certain edginess to it. And even when we did all the teaming work later on, it still had the edginess to it. So we didn't ever, sometimes you just can't stamp out some negative aspects of culture, but we could do it team by team and so I, I would you know sometimes you can actually have this conversation outside of some sort of higher level organizational values conversation it's like what does this team value we we value timeliness we value quality of work we value caring for each other um, and that becomes your little mini culture and sometimes that can go out and work with the larger system or sometimes the larger system Going back to the earlier point from Mel, there is a immunological response. Sometimes the culture surrounds you and spits you back out. <laughs> but I would say for ten after ten years, Alexander, I don't think we ever changed the culture at Oxfam America, did we? I don't think we changed the culture at Oxfam America, but I think certain teams adopted different ways of working and different behaviors at a micro level, which changed certain units, divisions, and functions. And I can say just positively that many people have evolved and moved on, including myself and others. And they said that the space you created, Alexander, still stands, but it never, you know, it's it's under assault by the, the, the pressures and dynamics of the system that it's in, right? That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. It's a good example. <clears throat> Siobhan, can I call on you? Yes, thank you. Um, as you were describing this, I was thinking of um, a recent Harvard Business Review about the, the importance of storytelling as, and it kind of goes with what Alexander was saying, because it's always evolving. So I work with um, Southwest, and last year, 
um, one of, I do executive coaching for somebody and there was a big debacle last um, Christmas, not this past Christmas, but the Christmas of 2022. And they have such a strong culture. So they do a lot of things right about culture. Um, do they mandate it and write it down? Um, they don't have a culture code per se, but they have the values that everyone was talking about and the systems that align. However, it was, as it was evolving with this team that I was working with through this um, executive was how to fine tune it a little bit using that story because it was a story of teaming. The team came together to overcome and that became a story of fine tuning a little bit more with accountability and a little bit more of how to alter some of the systems and communication for change. So I think, yes, the teaming is so important and the teams can change. And those stories that resonate that are very memorable because those the systems are important, but it's what people are talking about at the meetings that really people remember what the culture is. Are you talking about problems? Are you talking about solutions? Are you talking about people? Are you talking about you know, um, money, all those things give attributes to what that culture is. So it, it shifted. I wouldn't say it changed, but it was evolving because of this incident, this story of a lot of heroes, um, that's how I see it, um, came through and, and altered it a bit to put more systems in place, but they did it, they knew it, they understood it, and now they live it. Love that example. Yeah, I love that. Um, I just want to echo the, the word shift. Yeah. I would love nothing more than to call our service organizational shifts. That's yeah, yeah, them. I know. Yeah, I think it's more realistic. I know. Because it's because it's how people work and you can't change everything. But yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lauren. Lauren. Lauren, nice to see you all. Um, I actually have a question for Jim and Alexander, your work with Oxfam. Um, interesting how you describe the change at the team level, but um, not ever really able to shift at the full, at the organizational level. And I'm curious um, sort of what the role of the, the leaders uh, at different levels of the organization may or may not have had in that change and uh, inhibition to change, I guess. Jim, all yours. Um, well, I, two perspectives. I came in for an eight-year period there as the COO with a guy who, I'm not sure how long Ray was there, but like 20 years, Alexander, something like that. 20. Um, so Ray said to me that when he came 20 years earlier, right, or a long time ago, the culture already had this certain sort of aspects to it that he couldn't change, mm -hmm. but he tried. And so you can say over his 20 year period, some of those things he didn't even change. And then if we look at just that eight year period, Alexander joined me at the end of year one. Um, I think we knew that we didn't want to be this way, but there's something in those slides you were talking about earlier that like, not only does it reinforce itself, but it kind of polices itself. Like it forces out, it kind of, you kind of get stuck. Remember you had those different colored dots, Janice? Well, imagine if the dots somehow implied good or bad culture. And you had like bad, bad culture dots and good culture dots. Well, if you had a lot of bad culture dots everywhere inside the organizational structure, it's acting on you. And it turns out that it wasn't necessarily at the top. In fact, to the earlier point that, that, uh, that uh, Tosca made, we tried top down stuff. It didn't work. We had to sort of start to walk the talk and it was, we actually had to get one team to do it. And then we had, to Grace's point earlier, we actually had teams acting as individuals. Like we had in that last call, Mathoni talking about the, on the last first Friday of the battle between one team and another team and having team to team interactions and creating a team to team culture. We actually had that happen, but it only went so far. Like we got it out to about, I would say most of the leadership team within Oxfam America. But then we tried to roll it out to all of Oxfam, which was 10,000 staff. And I forget how many people we put through the lab training, but it was like 300 or 400, Alexander? It was 490. 490 people. And we tried to do reinforcing and stuff like that. But 
I don't think we had enough reinforcing to talk about that air stuff. So we had good articulation, we had some integration, but the reinforcement mechanisms were actually negative, not positive, i.e. there was counter reinforcement going on or pushing back mm. as the culture fights you. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And that's why there's separate parts of air because yeah, the operation people, or you can say, okay, let's integrate this. But if it's not reinforced over time, over and over and echoed in the drumbeat, it's not gonna stick. I've got two people to bring in, first Tanya and then Susan. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everyone. Hey, Tanya. Happy New Year. Hope you guys can hear and see me. Um, so I've used the Corenta team wheel before as a framework to assess and understand organizational culture, you know, recognizing that, you know, mutual accountability, collaborating and cohesion roles, purpose and the, and the ecosystem base are all fundamental parts of culture. And so I was curious to hear whether you've also used this before um, when you're looking at sort of organizational culture assessment and also how you see the interlinkages between the Corentis team wheel and the two tools that you just walked us through. That's fascinating. <clears throat> so Tanya, that's a, that's a first for me at least to hear that you use the team wheel for understanding culture. So it's nice to hear that. Um, so I have not, just to be clear. Um, so I have not made a direct linkage between thinking path and the team wheel. So, I mean, outside of the fact of taking a look at the wheel as a system of tools and methods, right? Actions that one would take to build a, a high-performing team, I've not melded the two together. But it's nice to hear that you have used the team wheel as a way to understand culture. That's really mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah, and maybe that there is an opportunity to meld the two together. Yes, they seem very complementary. Yeah. My mind is racing as you speak. <laughs> and I think we've done so without the explicitness. In other words, you know, we, we go in and work with teams because they want to go from good to great or the dysfunctional and they need some support. And so what are the shifts? What's the current state, desired state of that organization? And we utilize one of the assessment tools we utilize is that a voice of the team? What is the focus area that can help that team shift? And then say it's mutual accountability or say it's, you know, um, you know, a better, you know, they want to be a better decision-making body or say it's, you know, D and I, right? So that team wants to shift and then we cascade that learning throughout the rest of the organization. And that in and of itself, that we don't sell it as such, is a culture shift, is a culture change. It's helping the organization get much more proficient at a particular area of the team wheel, you know, such as mutual accountability, which one could consider being a culture shift because that's what happens. I, I believe that some organizations are very afraid of hiring somebody to do a culture change for a number of reasons. One, it just seems like a big thing to do. It seems like a very expensive thing to do. There are some certainly that do it, um, but we've found that sometimes it's a little, it's easier for organizations to hire for a team and then have that cascade. It maybe it just seems easier for them to get their head around. It seems more tactical and operational, maybe easier to um, identify as a service. I mean, I don't know. I'd love anybody else to share their thoughts? So this is along the line, Susan, I think of what you were raising. Did you want to say something today? I'm coming from the perspective of being in a leadership role now and looking, noticing that our, our leadership teams either are non-existent or uh, the executive leadership team does not operate as a real team. <laughs> and as you were all were talking, I was reflecting on um, what's what do, I'm very clear on what the culture is within my division and within a number of other divisions that have very different missions. But I cannot really enunciate what the organizational culture is because it doesn't feel very really integrated. Um, and I'm not sure if it, that's because I'm 
I'm a deputy, so the division chiefs are on the leadership team, and I just occasionally uh, act for my um, for my division chief. Um, so I'm not seeing an integrated culture, and that group is not, despite saying that they want to uh, function more strategically, they they're not even talking in a way that looks at the organization as a whole. And so I'm curious about where where to start in trying to um, trying to move some of the destructive cultures toward one that's more constructive. That's a challenge. I, I completely, I, I, I hear you. So we love obviously working with on the leadership team level, but sometimes, not always, but sometimes there are influ teams within an organization that have more influence that aren't on the leadership level or a team you can put together of influencers, of champions. So we've seen both of those be helpful. It, that makes sense. I didn't realize that might be what I'm trying to do um, with our superintendent and a couple of other people who are who are influential over this team. Maybe that's what I really need to focus is um, forming that team that can then influence the others because they are very, very solid. If we have a client who actually has a culture team. That um, so feel for, let's let's take this offline. I'm happy to walk you through that. Just pop I, me an email. I, I like that that framing. Thank you. Sure, no worries. It's good to be here with you. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. And with that, my friends, we have come to the end of our first Friday. So thank you, Alexander. You want to do a super quick mindfulness moment to transition us back into the world in which we came. Super quick. Super quick. Because we're past time, unfortunately. Everybody take a deep breath. <laughs> a quick, deep breath. And just in that breath, reflect upon what it is that you are walking away with today. Feel free to take another deep breath. and reflect upon what it is that you had an insight about today. And with that, I think we'll leave it at that, Janice. Thank you, it was wonderful to be with you all. So great to start the year with you and I wish you all the best. Thank you, Janice. Thanks, thanks you guys. Take care.